Okay, if I can welcome everyone to this, the 15th meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2018. The first item on our agenda is the consideration of new petitions. The first petition is Petition 1705 on Wildlife Crime, Penalties and Investigation by Alex Milne. Members have a copy of the petition and the briefing prepared by Spice and the Clarks. The petition calls for a review of the penalties available for incidents of wildlife crime and the methods by which wildlife crime is investigated. The petitioner considers that by increasing the minimum punishment to three years in prison, the crime then is characterised as serious, or categorised as serious, which in turn would allow investigating authorities to use covert video surveillance. This is a matter that has previously been considered by the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, and wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Angus? Okay, um, yes, yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, obviously, as a member of the ECLAIR Committee, I've, uh, over the last few years, we've been following this um, extremely closely, um, and I've certainly got a lot of sympathy for the, the petition. Um, I think that given there doesn't seem to have been much movement, or there hasn't been much apparent movement uh, on the Scottish Government's side uh, with regard to Professor a Pesty's recommendation to increase penalties. Um, this petition is quite timely, so uh, I think we need to know where the Scottish Government is with regard to its proposed consultation and the introduction of primary legislation, because if there's to be primary legislation, then you know time's running out uh, in this session. Um, so it would be good to get some clarity on that. OK, so we're agreeing to write to the Scottish Government um, seek its views in the action call for the petition, but I think specifically around your point about timescales as well, since mm -hmm. a general nod in the direction of it wouldn't be sufficient. We would want something more specific. Indeed. Uh, Rachel? Angus mentioned the Eclair Committee, um, and um, perhaps we should um, flag it up with the committee um, that, that we are looking at um, this and in advance of the scrutiny of the um, Wildlife Crime in Scotland report. Yeah, I think the committee is due to uh, look at uh, the wildlife crime report in January, so uh, the sooner they're made aware of, uh, of this petition, the better. OK. Any other suggestions? Just a minute. Right. If, there's, if there are stakeholders, other stakeholders uh, here that we can, uh, we can seek the views of here, I'm not quite sure who that would be. Yeah. The clerks to have a look at who might be the best groups, and obviously there, there would be maybe... Um, views from those involved closely with this in, in, uh, in the Eclair Committee that might have a suggestions in that. But I think that's an important idea. I mean, we know from um, coverage yesterday in social media that there have been some commentary again on that cruelty to animals and so on. So um, I think it's something... Or, and protection of wildlife, this is a theme that's been in this committee in the past around mountain hares and, and, and other creatures. So I think it's something... There's a lot of interest in. So I think we're agreeing to write to the Scottish Government to take the views of other stakeholders, but particularly to flag up to the um, ECCLR committee um, that this is a petition that has been um, submitted to, to us. Is that agreed? OK. Thank you for that. And we can thank the petitioner again for a petition which is um, timely again. So the next petition for consideration is Petition 1706 on introducing a law to allow pets in rented and supported accommodation, and this is by Geraldine Mackenzie. The petition is calling for a law to be introduced which allows all Scottish residents who live in rented and supported accommodation to let their pets live with them. Our briefing states that there is no legislation in Scotland which specifically bans pets from being kept in rented or supported accommodation. The briefing goes on to explain that it is the type of tenancy agreement a tenant has which determines whether they can keep pets in their property. The petitioner argues that there are legal precedents which support legislation that bans no pet covenants, citing a journal article providing examples of legislation in other countries prohibiting the use of no pet covenants. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Rachel? I think this is a difficult one because um, I, I completely get that um, pets help with social isolation and also then we've got the fact that there's um, no legislation in Scotland which bans um, pets from being kept in rented or supported accommodation. However, um, to support the petitioner, um, perhaps we could write to um, the you know, likes of Shelter Scotland 
and the Scottish Association of Landlords. Um, perhaps there are other um, rental sector organisations that the clerks could um, look at and housing associations. And just on that point, perhaps it might be in the interest of the um, petitioner to have um, be got in touch with more housing associations. I, I'm just not clear on that that point of our responsibility. It may be that we, we could contact the uh, Scottish Federation of Housing Associations because they, they will be will have a view, I expect, and perhaps are giving advice to um, their own members. I mean, this is an issue, I think it's a general issue, maybe for older people, that a pet can be a great companion. Um, we know that there's an issue about people who will not accept, homeless people will not accept accommodation because they're not able to take their pet with them, and uh, you know, some people are ending up in the streets because this companion they have can't be accommodated with them. And I think, we've, and I think that is something um, that certainly strikes me as an issue that has to be dealt with. Um, we also know, on the other hand, that neglected pets in properties can cause problems for um, other residents and tenants. So it's, I'm interested to see how. How housing associations where they do allow this, where they get that balance right, how easy it is to police um, tenants who are not looking after their pets properly, how would we, how would that, that side of it be um, protected? I wonder if there are any other views. Brian? The only other one really would be to, you know, as pair as to uh, seek the views of the Scottish Government just to see where they, they sit with the, with the petition. There was a, an, an interest in it in, in the recent past. I know Claudia Beamish from own um, party has raised this issue and sees it as an issue about inclusion and so on. So I'm not sure at that point where the Scottish Government responded, but I'm sure it's something they must be both aware of. I think there'll be present, re, representations already have been made by groups like Shelter Scotland, so it'd be interesting to know whether they think... A, there's, an, there's two separate things. A, is it an issue? And B, does it require legislation? Yeah. You know, these are two different things. You can recognise the social good, but perhaps it's not actually require legislation to do it. So that might be worthwhile establishing. David? It might, it might not be worth seeking the thoughts of COSLA because local authorities are the ones who have to deal with this all the time, whether it's for or against. Um, so it might be worth getting their views. OK, is that agreed then? So we contact Scottish Government, COSLA, um, Shelter Scotland, Scottish Association of Landlords and the SFHA. Um, I think in, that would give us an opportunity to reflect not just on whether what is asked for in the petition about the idea of people having pets is a good thing, but do you need to legislate for it and what kind of safeguards and protections you need to put in place as well. Okay, in that case, can I thank the petitioner again for the petition. We will um, seek those responses and we will come back to this petition at a later stage and of course the petition at that point will have a further opportunity to respond to the submissions that are made. Um, and can we now suspend briefly um, to allow witnesses for the next petition to join the table. Um, call the meeting back to order and um, move on to the next item on our agenda, which is the consideration of continued petitions. The next petition for consideration is Petition 1678 on National Strategic Framework for Countryside Ranger Services in Scotland by Ranger Bob Reid on behalf of the Scottish Countryside Rangers Association. We will take evidence in this petition from Scottish <coughs> Natural Heritage. And can I welcome to the meeting Eileen Stewart, Head of Policy and Advice, and Alan McPherson, People and Places Unit Manager. Uh, can I welcome you? Thank you for your attendance today. You have an opportunity to provide a brief opening statement of up to no more than five minutes, after which we'll move to questions from the committee. Thank you, Convener. 
Um, I'd like to make an opening statement, if, if that's okay. Just what I was proposing to do is to provide um, a brief overview of a Scottish natural heritage's role in relation to ranges and give you some thoughts on the petition and actions that we might take forward to address the concerns raised in the petition. Um, so firstly, I'd like to say SNH is very supportive of Scotland's ranges. Ranges provide a hugely valuable role in connecting people with nature. Their blend of local knowledge and skills in engaging people mean they're ideally placed to encourage the public to enjoy the outdoors and care about the environment. I think as well as these traditional roles, they increasingly contribute to a wide range of Scottish Government's outcomes, particularly in supporting health and well-being of our communities and encouraging community engagement and social inclusion. We very much welcome the SCRA petition and the spotlight it shined on the role of rangers. We think it's highlighted the need to focus collectively on ensuring the full value of ranger services is recognised and support from all parties is maintained in the long term. We agree with the analysis in the SCRA petition that these are challenging financial times and what's needed now is renewed recognition by all parties of the value of what rangers deliver for the people of Scotland and also visitors to Scotland. And I think we need to find creative solutions to the problems of reduced resources so that we can collectively make a fresh commitment to deliver the Ranger framework. We will continue to work with SCRA and other partners to take forward a series of action to engender this renewed commitment to support Rangers and provide a sustainable future for what we think is a highly regarded service across Scotland. We have had recent meetings with SCRA representatives and I can explain some of the discussions we've had on developing a plan of work for the coming year to encourage this wider engagement and support for Ranger services. The petition expresses concern about the declining number of Ranger posts and the reduced recognition of the brand um, Scottish Rangers. As with other public bodies, we work within the budgets that are allocated to us. We are, we are committed to ensuring that our funding for community and private Ranger services is tailored to support our corporate plan which has a particular emphasis on connecting people with nature and also uh, supporting other government outcomes. I'd also like to emphasise that our continued support is built into our business plan and we've made some notable new commitments this year. Just to give you a flavour of these, um, as part of the Year of Young People, we're developing a junior ranger scheme in Scotland's urban areas, commencing with a pilot scheme in Aberdeen. This will be working with local authorities and partners to get young people involved in nature on their doorstep, learning about the environment and, most importantly, having fun outdoors. As part of the Aberdeen Junior Ranger Services, we're trialling kit libraries because we understand that there are barriers to people, young people enjoying the outdoors, particularly if they don't have specialist um, equipment like boots and outdoor waterproofs. We're also in discussion with SCRA about updating the Junior Ranger Toolkit and looking at ways to support additional resources to relaunch the SCRA Junior Ranger Programme. We'll be following up with SCRA in the near future how we work together on these commitments and we're hoping to take this forward at a Ranger Development Partnership meeting which we're aiming to host on an SNH Nature Reserve in January. So, to conclude, we understand the concerns of SCRA in relation to the loss of local authority ranger services posts and the perception that ranger services do not always receive the recognition they deserve. We'll continue to work with partners to highlight the important role rangers play in improving health and well-being as well as enjoyment of the natural environment. Um, we think the vision, purpose and aims set out in the 2008 um, uh, framework are still relevant, but we would be happy to talk about refreshing this um, in the new year. Finally, I just wanted to say that we would like to work with SCRA and other partners to explore new funding avenues and creative ways to highlight the valuable work Rangers do. Um, we very much welcome the committee's reflections on how we can do more in this field and work together with other partners to raise the profile of Ranger service, service and encourage broader support for them in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, can I maybe uh, begin by asking you, I mean, I hear what you say about the value of SCRA and the value of the Ranger Service. 
How would you respond to the questions put by the petitioner in his submission dated 23rd September, particularly with regard to the withdrawal of grant aid support? Um, the petitioner appears to suggest it indicates the SNH, despite what you've said, does not believe the service offered value for money. And I also hear what you say about constrained budgets, but you still make choices within your constrained budget. So um, I wonder whether um, your budget choices actually reflect more on your value of the service rather than what you've said there just now. Thank you. Um, it's a very good point, and, and it's obviously something we think through carefully. We have to make choices across all of the work that we do. Um, but I think it's also worth noting that um, change, Ranger services have never remained fixed. Our funding has always supported where um, Ranger services are developing or where there are particular challenges and we think they need support. But in some cases, they've then developed and found other sources of funding or have found other sustainable ways of, of maintaining their service. So there's always been a dynamic kind of um, suite of Ranger services, if you like. Um, what we've tried to do is our, our budget, budgets have been restricted is make sure that we focus on Ranger services where the opportunities for alternative funding are, are very limited, particularly in, in remote and rural areas on places like Fula and, and the Western Isles, where you know, there are limited opportunities to uh, gain sort of commercial support or, or visitor uh, income receipts. But you know, we recognise that we, we have to, to put our money where we get the most um, sort of value for money. And we've also focused very much on supporting range of services where they're working with disadvantaged communities, social inclusion. So, so we reach out to communities and, and individuals who might otherwise not have that access to the countryside. So it isn't re a reflection at all on our lack of support or recognition of ranges. It's just trying to target our money at where it will have most, most impact. So you don't think there's a role for having a recognisable Scottish-wide range of service, which is what the petitioner wants? You're effectively funding individual projects rather than an approach to the countryside. Uh, we, we've always done both. So we've always supported a small number of range of services. Uh, prior to 2009, we contributed to range of services across local authorities. But obviously, with the change in the way uh, the financial support for local authority range of services was, was, was made through the government settlements, we, we no longer support local authority range of services. And, and they have that responsibility and have taken forward that in you know, a range of diverse ways. So our funding since that time has focused on um, community services and, and um, private, where we're supporting private landowners to provide uh, ranger services. So we, we've, we've never supported the whole suite of, of ranger services. We've always supported those where you know, we, we feel there are particular um, needs, if you like. I think the other important thing to say is that We've, we've never been, I suppose, the sole body responsible for range of services. What we've tried to do is provide the framework and the support so that the brand is maintained and there's a recognisable range of service provided by a range of different um, employers, but people can, can access the countryside and know that they will get a welcome and support there. Do you have any role then in monitoring what local authorities have done? If you're seeing funding's gone to them, they're not necessarily providing that service so you can see the service across all of Scotland, but you have a responsibility to have a Scotland-wide service. So are you monitoring with local authorities? Are you reporting on what local authorities are doing? And do you have a role in advising government that effectively this isn't working? Um, we do have a role in, in monitoring services, and, and I'll ask my colleague to say a bit more about that. We've produced um, a, a couple of reports where we've... Um, they're available on our website where, where we've essentially gone out to all the local authorities to check what they're doing, uh, ask for support. There's, there's some quite useful information out there. So we did that um, twice. Uh, we, we sought information from all local authorities about the range of services, the numbers, the types of activities they did to try and get that kind of overview. But also, um, part of what we were trying to do is get them to sort of share good practice and, and to find out, you know, some of the new methods and, and things that were working in different areas. Because I think inevitably, range of services are there isn't going to be a one size fits all, and, and we recognise local authorities now deliver some of the range of service functions in a, in a sort of slightly different way. So we have biodiversity officers and access officers. So local authorities have, have chosen to take forth the, the work of rangers in, in some different models. 
Um, I'll pass on to Alan, who might say a bit more about that, that monitoring and reporting, if, if that's OK. Uh, just add that back in 2008, it was recognised that we needed to do more to get broader recognition of the value of Rangers, particularly with even you know, declining budgets at that time. And that's where we devised this idea of, sort of an annual report back from all Ranger services, relatively easy to do for the ones that we were actually directly funding, but also asked all the other Ranger services across Scotland to contribute one a year with some basic um, quantitative information about what they were actually delivering uh, and some examples of where they were being innovative in engaging with new audiences, working with different partners, that type of thing, so that we could actually publish that information and, uh, and say that could be used then to build the case, build awareness amongst the elected members, amongst senior decision makers, and actually build support. Rangers are involved in so much work that I think it's a slight danger that they, they, they're not noticed. Um, and this was, I'd say, they actually are important and they are involved in doing a lot of things. Unfortunately, we didn't get a huge um, uptake from a number of local authority ranger services. So we published the, uh, a couple of reports back in 2011 and 12. And again, it has some sort of good case examples there. But again, with limited information, we haven't done it since then. And again, that's how we'd be asking for information on things like ranger numbers as well as what they do. What proportion responded? Um, 50%? Uh, probably less, actually. And again, it was different in the years we did it, sort of thing. Right. So less have, than have that. Have you got any statutory role in, in informing government? Because it's a bit of a concern if you're monitoring something, you get less than 50% response. Does the Scottish government even know what the state of the range of services is? There isn't a statutory requirement to report. No, this was um, uh, something that we uh, committed to in the, the, the Ranger framework and something that you know, all parties agreed was a good idea, but there's no requirement on local authorities to respond or to provide that information to us. So we have, we have limited um, teeth, if you like, in, in uh, requesting them to provide information. We've done uh, you know, a lot of work to encourage the range of services that we, we do have contact with and also through SCRA to try and get their support to get that information. But I think as, as the responses to your petition sort of revealed, some local authorities are, um, have very well established range of services and, and support them with, with good networks and good infrastructures. But in other local authorities, it's, it's a, a rather mixed picture. OK, thanks. Angus MacDonald. OK, thanks. <coughs> thanks, convener, um, and good morning. Um, the, the information uh, that, that you have has clearly uh, increased since your submission uh, that we received on the, the, the 27th of, of February. But if I could ask you to expand on monitoring of ranger services and, and ranger numbers uh, a bit more. Um, in your submission uh, of the 27th of February, you confirmed that it, uh, you don't monitor range of numbers, but you're aware of anecdotal evidence that numbers, particularly in local authorities, are dropping. Uh, and you stated that the funding of ranger posts is a matter for each local authority in the context of other funding priorities and budgetary pressures. Uh, and you've said earlier uh, that you're monitoring ranger services, but has SNH given any consideration to introducing a system to monitor ranger numbers? And um, if I could also ask you um, if you know how many private and community-based ranger services uh, previously funded by SNH have succeeded in finding uh, sustainable alternative resources of funding. Mm -hmm. I'll ask Alan if that's OK to respond to that. Uh, the, the, the mechanism we had for monitoring uh, ranger's numbers was through this annual uh, uh, submissions reporting return which as we discussed previously we got rather limited response to so we have the numbers for the ones we um, directly support I've only some information on the other ones as well in terms of um, services that we uh, no longer support it's, it's 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 if we look back at the last three years there's probably only two services that um, we previously supported that are no longer operating. And it's not simply because of SNH funding. There's a whole host of reasons as to why a service decides to do something differently, uh, just different local, different priorities, that sort of thing. So, um, and again, I'm not quite sure they may not be operating. There's often, over the years, there's been a sort of constant turnover in services coming on, on stream, going off uh, stream as well, sort of thing. So it's a difficult to answer that one particularly. But we do know that within the services we do 
uh, support, again, because our funding only um, contributes to a proportion of their costs, they all need to uh, look for other sources of funding and have been looking for new sources over the last few years. And some of the novel ones, for example, uh, particularly up in, in the sort of Northern Isles, has been trying to get contributions from some of the cruise ships and some of the ferry operators who are obviously bringing quite a lot of the customers to the range of service. And I think that's very, very welcome as well. Has that happened? Have the cruise ship companies contributed? Sorry? Has that happened? Has, have it they... has happened, yes. Right, okay. A small a sort, of, uh, a sort of proportion per head of the visitors they're bringing. Okay. Right, thanks. Um, the committee received a, a number of responses after its uh, first consideration of the petition. Um, for example, the, the National Trust for Scotland stated that it believed the strategy uh, should be supported. Um, and it suggests uh, that rangers' functions should be supported with added value through coordination and sharing ideas. So could you give us some more examples of, of, uh, of, of how that is happening on the ground um, and you know, perhaps expand a bit more on whether the, the biodiversity officers that you mentioned and local authorities are actually filling the gap or, or if, if that's not the case? Um, yes, I mean, the, the, as we've, we've mentioned, there are kind of a, a range of different models that have developed, and, and some of the submissions have reflected that. In Highland Council now, the range of services is, is supported through uh, an independent organisation, High Life Scotland, uh, so High Life Highland, sorry. Um, in Aberdeenshire Council, they still have a, um, a kind of traditional model where they have six range of services and, and a, a supporting officer and, and a framework and so on. Um, we work with SCRA through the Ranger Development Partnership, and that has been the forum where we've worked with a, a range of bodies to try and find out what support do Ranger services need uh, in terms of professional development, in terms of sharing ideas, looking at ways of sharing experience of generating income through charging and through the range of things we've talked about. Um, and there have also been uh, forum days and, and days where we've got all the rangers together to sort of, you know, to share ideas and work together. So there's a range of kind of formal and informal mechanisms for that, that sharing of expertise. And we do see value in that. I mean, it, I think we, um, uh, many of us have started our careers as rangers and, and we do see that there's a value in, in that career path and that sort of career development uh, function that provided. But I think it's, it's perhaps quite difficult now as these new models are emerging and range of services are being deployed in different ways and doing a slightly um, more diverse role in different places. And one of the things which has been new and, and I think is quite as encouraging is we are also supporting some of the project work that rangers do. Um, in Dundee City, for instance, we're supporting um, a health partnership where we're not providing um, funding to the ranger services, but we're providing um, support for the range of work they're doing to support health and inclusion and encourage people to get outdoors and enjoy you know, the natural environment and get the health benefits from that. So um, I think increasingly that may be the model that local authorities will go down to, to recognise that ranger services although they still are very important in getting people out of doors and enjoying nature, they're also important in getting people outdoors so they get the full benefits of you know, the health improvement, the social inclusion and some of these other wider um, functions they support. And I think that's where, in the future, trying to get that understanding that they deliver more, it's not just that very sort of narrow environmental focus, and potentially getting that kind of funding model slightly different because we recognise that they are contributing in a preventative spend way to you know, health outcomes and a range of other things that local authorities obviously are, are investing in. So um, you know, that, that's maybe a model and a way that we um, you know, think that the, the services will grow in future. And that's clearly a main thrust of, of SNH's policy at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Kavira. Good morning. I think probably it's a good time to declare that I have a family member who happens to be uh, a ranger, um, although that happens to be uh, down in, in England. So I'm very well aware of the work uh, that they do, the valuable work that they do um, in the community and, and uh, getting the community to be included um, and, and the opportunity to get into the uh, into the great wild outdoors. And submissions we received uh, appear to indicate that many of the local authorities don't have 
that sort of three to five year strategy pro probably that uh, in place that would probably help the, help the case. I wonder if you've any thoughts or views on that? Um, it's tricky. I think it's something that um, there is good practice out there. And I mentioned Aberdeen City Council and, and they do have that strategy, forward plan and, and annual reporting. So there's definitely examples of good practice and, and you know, models that other local authorities could use. But I think it, it depends to a certain extent on, on the focus and the priority uh, in, in different local authorities. And um, you know, we, we do as much as we can to ensure that that good practice is shared and there are opportunities for other local authorities to, to use those models. But it, I guess local authorities do things in, in ways that they think is, is suitable for their areas. And some see their range of services as being part and parcel of, of a wider group of staff that, that deliver these more specialist functions. And so they wouldn't necessarily see them needing a standalone ranger strategy. So um, I think it's quite hard to, to sort of dictate a one size fits all. And that's where we saw the framework being quite important because it's established some broad principles and, you know, key things that we thought rangers should do and, and effectively set that sort of scene and, and framework across the piece, but then could be adapted and, and tailored to local circumstances. And, and we still think that's, that's an appropriate model and, and important to have that, you know, that, that sort of backstop and that scene setting. Okay. If I could, can you just following on from, from some of the, the questions that Kibiria uh, started along, I, th I think from what I gather here and what would concern me is how that map of, of, of uh, Scotland looks like in terms of gathering of that information of what's happening within all local authorities. I mean, who's gathering that information? How's that being reported on? And, and, and uh, you know, how, how is that then brought brought to be brought to that, that knowledge brought to perhaps to the Scottish government so we have that understanding of, of, of uh, you know, where the, the gaps are in the offer. Um, well, we touched on that earlier, and, and we, we have had, you know, on, on a couple of occasions, tried to gather that information and pull together as much as we could. Obviously, we have compre prom comprehensive information on range of services we support, but partial information on, on what local authorities have been doing, and that information has been published and, and shared with Scottish Government. So it's, it's been very open and, and transparent, but there isn't a sort of statutory reporting mechanism. It has been something that's been done um, on a voluntary basis. We've invited and, and encouraged uh, responses, um, but, but that has, has been, you know, partially successful, I would say. Um, and, and, you know, we would like to continue that, but I, I think it's hard for us to um, be sure if we'll get greater traction and, and anything the committee could do. I mean, we see Cosler and... Um, potentially having a role in this, but uh, to date, you know, they haven't been able to enable that, that greater um, support. I don't know if there's anything you want to add, Alan. I mean, again, over the years, we, we have continued to push the advantages of trying to provide us with information and what we can do with it. And I get we, we found it quite frustrating in some ways that we haven't been provided uh, with the information, had, had the support from some of the partners to do that, because uh, we can see the advantages of doing it. So again, if there's anything the committee can help to to encourage uh, a stronger response, then that would be helpful. But uh, again, given that I think you got a response from 14 out of 32 local authorities to your own request for information, that's probably indicative of what the sort of same sort of situation we find as well. So you, do, you, you, you would report then the, the lack of information then? I mean, that's, that's part of any report, isn't it? You would, you would report that the local authorities who did, did not respond? We did. We made it quite clear um, the, the, the number that responded and, and the fact that there was a relatively low response from, from local authorities. So um, that's, that's been a, a, a pattern and we've been um, quite you know, open about that. Thank you. Uh, Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, a number of written submissions have com commented on concerns that additional, that, of, about the additional uh, value that rangers provide. And bearing in mind that we're already discussing that a few local authorities no longer offer um, the service of the rangers or um, they offer a diminished service. Um, do you believe that um, the role that the rangers play in supporting education, exercise, um, uh, raising awareness of biodiversity and the general enjoyment of the country countryside is being compromised? Um, whether it's being compromised is... is I suppose a matter of you know opinion, but I think there's certainly there's potential mist, if you like. Um, we see ranger services having absolutely you know crucial part to play in that whole picture 
of encouraging people outdoors. And I, I think in, in the current kind of circumstances, we're more and more realising how important that connection with nature and that experience of learning in an outdoor environment and, you know, spending time outdoors is so important for people's health, but also, you know, children's learning and, and development. I mean, there have been some very interesting and, and novel approaches being used. I think you might have seen in um, the press in um, Shetland, uh, the GPs are now prescribing time outdoors and, and walks, nature walks, as part of their um, health, mental health response and so on. So um, at the moment, there's, there's lots of recognition, but I think at the moment there's not a sort of joining up of support and um, funding, if you like, to provide the response and the sort of preventative spend um, potential that could be delivered through through rangers, particularly, but you know other types of um, outdoor provision. But rangers are ideally um, placed because they have that unique experience of skills, working with people. The education potential they have is is, is huge, and that's one of the, the key roles they play. So there's certainly you know a big opportunity for local authorities to to use them in a in a more um, you know holistic way. I would say. There seems to be a disjointed approach, and Alec McPherson said that, you know, if the committee can help at all with the lack of um, information that the local authorities have been giving. However, um, is it not, you know, something that SNH should, should be working towards is to actually um, prioritising uh, the value of the rangers? You've talked highly about the value of rangers. Um, there seems to be some sort of uh, disjointed approach here. Um, I'm not sure if it's a disjointed approach. There's, there's a varied approach, certainly, and a, a diverse approach. We, we have seen our role as, um, in many ways, providing the, the background information, the support. Um, we certainly have a role in, in promoting the good work that rangers do and, and the benefits that rangers can provide, and we've continued to do that. And through the work we're doing with the um, rolling out of the young ranger schemes and the support for rangers in, in certain areas, you know, that, that is a key part of our role to raise awareness and, and support the kind of good messages they do. But I, I think it's clear we can't do it all ourselves and we do rely on a number of other partners. Also, there are other government um, agencies involved. In the National Parks have a core role here. Loch Lomans and Trossachs and the Cairngorm National Parks both have different models again, but the local authorities are the largest. Um, sorry, the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park is now the largest single provider of ranger services. They have a, a very big um, a team of rangers and they also have a very large number of volunteers working, which is equivalent to sort of 30 staff posts in all doing practical work and work with, um, you know, encouraging people outdoors. So it's not something I think SNH can do alone. I think we can provide the materials, we can provide um, some of the messages and the awareness raising, but the delivery then has to be rolled out by these range of different, um, it, you know, groups and individuals. To a submission that SNH uh, gave um, back in February, um, there was. A it states that the, your previous cha chairman, Ian Ross, met with SCRA on the 3rd of August 2016 to discuss various topics. Um, I just wondered if um, your current uh, chairman, the meeting that was promised with the current chairman, had happened and what were the outcomes? Um, SCRA met our chief executive um, in March, not uh, long after that um, discussion. Uh, there hasn't been a meeting with the chair to date, but there was a very um, constructive meeting. Um, with SCRA and our chief executive in March, and that was followed up by a, a meeting a few months later so, uh, from our staff who are taking forward the work. So um, at that meeting, there were a range of ideas and thoughts which we are developing. Um, there was an agreement to uh, have a meeting of the Ranger Development Partnership in January, so we're, we're framing that up, and there was a range of discussion around some of the work that we touched on um, about the Junior Ranger Scheme, also looking at ways we can jointly promote the work that rangers do. So, so there's an ongoing dialogue, and that has continued, I think, when, when SCRA were here. Originally in January, they talked about, you know, they have an ongoing working relationship with our staff and are, are talking, you know, a, about a range of these things. So, so it, does, it does say in the submission that Mike Cantley, the chair, um, was, um, you know, you were planning to have a meeting with SCRA. Why didn't that happen, and is it going to happen? Um, 
I think it was felt it would be more useful. I'm, I'm not sure precisely, but I think it was felt more useful. The chief exec was more um, informed about the work that we were doing and would be in a better place to kind of catal to be a catalyst and, and ensure that there was a follow-up. So, um, it, you know, I, I don't think we felt it was uh, necessary. You know, it was an either or. It was part or. of your written submission. OK, <laughs> well... Uh, and that's what, you know, you stated. But um, So I don't know why there was a U-turn on that. But anyway, thank you. Yeah, Angus? Yeah, um, can I just pick up on that? Um, would it not be helpful to inform Mike Cantley uh, to have a meeting with SCRA as soon as possible? Um, I, I'm sure we can, we can organise that, yes. OK, thanks. Okay. Can, I suppose at the core of this is what is the role of SNH? I mean, you've been quite clear about all of the other organisations who could be doing things. You've said the range of service is a good thing. You've even talked about benefits in terms of health and well-being and social inclusion. But you use a phrase, maybe that could be a model. If it's a good model, who's going to drive it if it's not going to be SNH? Um, I think it's something that we'll follow up with the range of development partnership in January. Um, I think it's important that anything we do has the support of SCRA and has the support of other key players like COSLA because we can set the scene, we can um, come up with possible different funding models, we can come up with ways that we think the range of service can exp expand and evolve, but uh, it, you know, it will need to be delivered by others. So we can think ask that- why it needs to be delivered by others? Why could it not be SNH or could it be another government body? Can there not be a Scottish-wide organisation with funding that values this service and then delivers it? Because part of the problem is the sense from the petitioner that SNH has stepped away from this. It's not funding it. It's saying it's a good thing, but it's not either reporting that there's a problem. It's not driving it. it you, you've said a lot of very important things, I think, about the service, but have not taken ownership of the service. So if you're not going to take ownership of it, maybe you could explain why. And if not you, then who? Because what looks at the moment is happening is good things are happening in different places, but it's <laughs> at the mercy of events. It's not, there's nothing strategic about it. OK. Um, well, I think that the, the point where things um, took a different direction was in re relation to decisions about the funding model. Because initially, as I think we've, we've touched on, SNH supported uh, contributed to the funding of pretty much all the range of services across Scotland, including all the local authority services. So at that point, all of the range of services had an agreed programme of work that um, was part of the funding package and that was monitored and reported on or effectively that the funding wouldn't be um, committed. But, but that worked. <laughs> We felt that was effective, but the decision was made by government that it was more appropriate for that funded to be rooted through um, the settlements that local authorities had. So it was no longer ring-fenced for range of services. It, it was to be defined by local authorities the best ways to support their range of services, along with all of the other functions that they deliver. So at that point, um, our ability to influence um, and direct the work of rangers across Scotland obviously diminished. Um, so, so from then on, since then, what we have been able to do is support and fund, um, as far as possible, a range of private and, and particularly community-led services, and, and we'll continue to do that. But your view is it's a poorer service now because of that decision? Well, I, I think you'd, you'd have to take different views from, from but different organisations. your view organization. as an organisation is it, that what was there when you funded it and people, you monitored it and people were accountable to you, was a better service than we have now. And need local authorities, because it's not ring-fenced, are not necessarily providing the equivalent service there was before. Uh, it's, it's certainly di different. Um, it's harder for us to gather the information on what's happening and it's harder for us to effectively um, ensure that there's a common provision and a consistent provision across all the local authorities. One of the things that possibly it has enabled is local authorities to find different ways of, of um, providing that activity you and don't combining know that. it. You don't know we that don't know that. They're not no. reporting it, so that's... You're absolutely right. So, so I think probably from the... your perspective, you've now got a service that you have no, no longer got a sense fully of it being a Scottish-wide yes. service yes. that you've got any 
control over or any way of, of actually guiding. Can I ask you just for information, um, who's actually involved in the Ranger Development Partnership? Um, I'm not sure if I have the list in front of me. It's, uh, the membership has sort of evolved over time, but it's some of the most significant um, Ranger employers. Um, SCRA, obviously chair the, the, the partnership, but it has the, the two national parks. Do you provide there. us with a list that would probably be useful? We can do that, yes. Some, some of the councils are involved in there as well. And COSLA, although again, COSLA have actually, I don't think I've ever attended the meetings, <coughs> okay. which is a bit disappointing. So, my last question is, have you flagged up to the Scottish Government they now have a suboptimal service in comparison with what you delivered before? Um, we've updated them on, on the current provision and had discussions with them about um, how ranger services are evolving. So, so yes, um, not in a, f a formal way, but we are in, in obviously in discussion with them about ranger services on a on, you know periodic. Specifically said, to them, see that decision you made about the way you're funding ranger services was not really a good idea. Um, we probably haven't said it in quite those terms, no. Okay. Of the Ranger Development Partnership members, if you want them, convener, it's very short. The Scottish Countryside Rangers Association, SNH, National Trust for Scotland, Cairngorms National Park Authority, Loch Lomond, and the Trossachs National Park Authority, Historic Environment Scotland, a local authority ranger service representative, and a regional park ranger service representative. It may be worthwhile exploring how often they meet, whether there are minutes of their meetings and whether they discuss um, concerns about the quality of the service. Now, are there any final questions from anyone? No? no can I thank you very much for that. I think that has been um, very useful um, in illuminating some of the, the issues around, around the petition itself. I wonder if members have a view on how best we take this forward. Brian? I, th I think I think what's obvious uh, is there's the lack of a lack of an overall picture of what's actually happening within uh, within the service across Scotland. I think there seems to be a lack of responsibility of who's actually taking responsibility and who's driving this. Um, I think the fact that uh, local authorities uh, are not responding to to this probably tells a story in itself. I think for, for me, uh, first and foremost. The two things we need to look at, we need to look at where the gaps are, what the overall picture is within Scotland. Who is actually responsible for that? Who is responsible for, for delivering uh, the service? I think everybody would agree it's the kind of thing that, uh, um, that, that access to the outdoors is something that, that uh, uh, we would want all of our uh, children, let alone uh, adults, to have. So I would, I would like to know why, why they not, maybe cause this before, why are they not responding to this? Who, who is actually responsible? I'd like to write to the Scottish Government to understand who is responsible, responsible for reporting on the service. I mean, I wonder whether, I mean, I, I think we should get an update. I think it's a meeting of the Ranger Development Partnership in January. We should be asked for an update after that. Um, I actually think it'd be interesting to get the Cabinet Secretary in to talk about this because if the agencies involved are having issues, but nobody has ownership of it. You know, there's a decision at government level which yeah. may be ha may be having consequences that we wouldn't, nobody would want. And I think um, SNH have made clear that they value the service. Um, maybe we should be looking at how, to what extent Scottish government is aware and what's their response to these concerns. Mm -hmm. Rachel, I certainly think that it would be useful either to write or take evidence from the Ranger Development Partnership members about what actually the impact of, of this is, um, because there's a good, um, good representation there within that group. <clears throat> and I agree with you about COSLA, but then it's unusual because uh, it says that the um, SNH submission was actually, um, the statement was prepared with close involvement in a number of st key stakeholders, including COSLA and SCRA. So, I, I don't know where we are on this. Can we, we maybe take the opportunity to reflect further on how we take this forward, but I think there's been a number of suggestions. I don't think we want to let it go. It looks as if there are consequences to financial decisions which are now being played out in our communities, which certainly from the evidence we've heard this morning, people wouldn't want. I don't think anybody else would want, but it's who is to get a sense of whose responsibility it is to then kind of change direction, I think. So I think there's quite a lot there for the clerks to look on and we can reflect on further in terms of who we actually have in front of us in terms of witnesses at a future meeting. But with that, can I thank our um, witnesses today very much. I think that has been a very useful session.
and I appreciate the time you've given us. Um, and I'll suspend the meeting briefly to allow you to leave the table. OK, if I can call the meeting back to order. Um, what I would propose to do is a slight change in um, the order of the agenda. I want to go on now to petition 1651 on prescribed drug dependence and withdrawal. Um, I want to welcome Jackie Bailey, MSP, who has an interest in this petition, um, and it will allow her to participate, and then we can go back to the two items um, that we have moved from, but we will deal with them um, subsequent to this one. So this petition for consideration is petition 1651 on prescribed drug dependence and withdrawal by Marion Brown on behalf of Recovery and Renewal. Members may wish to note that a number of new written submissions on this petition have recently been received and will be brought to their attention once they have been checked by the clerks to ensure they comply with the Parliament's policy in submitting written evidence. At our last consideration of this petition, we agreed to write to the Scottish Government to ask what engagement it has had with Public Health England on its review of the evidence for dependence on and withdrawal from prescribed medicines. The Government explained that it wrote to Public Health England to ask them to consider extending the review to Scotland, but that its response stated that while it was happy to share the outcomes of its review, it had no plans to extend the scope to include Scotland. The government's response also states that it is currently exploring the possibility of taking forward a Scottish-focused review, which would run in parallel to the um, Public Health England review. The committee will also recall that it agreed to write to the British Medical Association to ask what its current position was in relation to the rollout of a national 24-hour helpline, um, recognising that it had been over two years since it had made this policy call. The response indicates that the BMA continues to support this call, but the establishment of a helpline quote should be clearly understood as a supplement to ongoing care from prescribers, not a replacement. The committee also wrote to the Royal College of General Practitioners and the Brit British Medical Association's Scottish GP Committee to establish to what extent GPs in Scotland recognise the issues raised in the petition and the guidance and training available to GPs to support people safely to withdraw from drugs such as benzodiazepines and antidepressants. Responses have been received and are included in our meeting papers. In her most recent sub submission, the petitioners draw our attention to the UK Parliament's all-party parliamentary group for prescribed drug dependence, which has uh, published a report based on an analysis of personal accounts of prescribed drug dependence and withdrawal submitted to petitions in Scotland and Wales. The petitioner wishes to draw particular attention to the patient journey maps featured in this report. And for ease of reference, these have been printed out for us to review at the meeting today, and we have them um, on our desks. I think it would be worth my commenting on the very substantial um, number of submissions from individuals. Um, and I have read them all in detail and found them um, 
Um, very interesting and thought-provoking, um, and we would want to thank people who have taken the time to respond. It should also be noted that within um, those submissions, there are also responses from GPs and um, people from the, the medical profession, as well as people who have identified concerns with their own experience um, of prescribed drug dependence. Um, and I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action on what clearly is an issue that has uh, generated a degree of interest um, more broadly than ourselves. I don't know whether it would be worth maybe asking Jackie, who I think um, the, one of the petitioners is a, a constituent you may want to um, help inform our thinking and your contribution. Thank you very much, convener, and I'm grateful for the opportunity um, to speak in support of this petition. You are, of course, quite right. Marion Brown, um, who brought this petition to Parliament, is my constituent, um, and I've been working with another who's experienced very severe withdrawal for, from anti depressant medication who's been involved in the petition as well. I wonder whether I could make just a couple of brief observations um, because I think it is important that whatever we do, um, whether it's the committee or the government, that we take an evidence-based approach. Now, it was the case that the target on antidepressant prescribing was moved away from, I think, in 2010. And since then, numbers who are receiving antidepressant medication have gone up. The prescribing bill, consequently, has gone up. Um, and Despite those ever-increasing numbers, we've not looked at the other end of the pipeline, if you like, where we're not considering the impact on people who are coming off and are having severe withdrawal symptoms. Now, there is evidence that suggests that the guidance that GPs are using is out of date, um, that some GPs aren't aware of the range of symptoms of withdrawal um, and therefore don't acknowledge it. As such, and indeed many GPs, as you referred to yourself, convener, who are aware of the problems this is causing and, and want to do something about it. I can say, having explored this for years with my constituent, that there are no specialist services out there, certainly not in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, which happens to be Scotland's largest health board. Um, we have been on a journey where there is little acknowledgement of the scale of her individual problems, never mind the scale of the problem overall. Um, like you, I have considered some of the evidence presented to the committee by hundreds of people with experience of antidepressants. They can't all be wrong in what they're describing, and therefore I would ask the committee to continue the very positive engagement with this petition um, and implore you not to wait for Public Health England to do the review, um, but actually to, do, to urge the government to do the review in Scotland. We shouldn't be tied to delays that maybe happen elsewhere. Health is devolved. We should be seizing the initiative here. And if I could be very cheeky and test the convener's patience just a little, um, I always think it's great when the Petitions Committee bid for debates in Parliament, and perhaps this is a candidate that could be considered. Okay. Thank By your you, standards, that's not cheeky at all. <laughs> um, I wonder if members have any... Thank you for that, Jackie. And I wonder if members have comments on how we take this petition forward. Brian? Um, I think, well, I think all, all of the committee are, would be, are very sympathetic to this uh, particular uh, petition. I think it strikes me that, that um, uh, it, it sits within a, 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 a wider issue around uh, prescribed uh, antidepressant drugs. A lot of the evidence is quite anecdotal um, as well, and I think that that, that worries me uh, in itself. And I think, uh, as, as Jackie Bailey, Bailey has alluded to, I would I would really like to push the, the Scottish Government to have its own mm -hmm. uh, review of this. As we know, um, uh, Scotland's relationship with with with, uh, 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 with this is, is entirely devolved and it's different. Um, so I would I think I would definitely want to try and try and capture you know, uh, the picture that we have within, uh, within Scotland itself uh, and actually get some really um, uh, cold hard evidence and a focus uh, on, on, the, on what is undoubtedly uh, a, a big issue. Okay, thanks. Angus? Okay, thanks, um, Camille. I think the, the, the salient point uh, today is the fact that the, the Scottish Government has stated um, that it's exploring the possibility of taking forward a Scottish focused review, uh, which would run in parallel with the, the one in England. Um, <clears throat> I mean, we, we obviously note the, the uh, attempt to, to link in with the, the uh, Public Health England review uh, and their refusal to, um, 
to, to allow that, so, which in a way is unfortunate, but uh, I think we do, of course, need uh, to have a Scottish uh, specific review. Um, I'd also be keen, I mean, I'm interested in the information from the, the BMA. I'd be keen to pursue uh, with the Scottish Government the BMA's continued call for a 24-hour helpline um, uh, for uh, prescribed drug uh, dependence. It's, it's well over two years since the BMA uh, yep. said in a letter that was sent to the Scottish Government um, that they wanted that. And while the BMA recognises uh, at the moment the Scottish Government's view that resources cannot be made available for a dedicated helpline, uh, I don't think we should uh, give up on that, uh, and I certainly admire the BMA's tenacity on this. Uh, it certainly seems to be part of the solution, and it would certainly help a number of uh, the people who, who we've, we've heard from in submissions. Yeah. I mean, I think the point about the helpline made by the BMA that wasn't a substitute for the role of the prescribers. I mean, it probably ought not to have had to been said, but that was part of the rebuttal by the Scottish Government, and I just think. The idea that uh, GPs were suggesting this would substitute for patient care is nonsense, but that kind of expertise, my sense of which, some of which is happening informally through forums and um, social media, in any event, it would be better if that were something that people could have some confidence in going to. You know, that there are support groups which are important to people who are dealing with it, but actually in terms of um, getting the appropriate advice, it does still feel to me that, that the, the, there's a strong argument for it. Mm -hmm. Rachel? Uh, I think Jackie Bailey is, has opened up another point about the, the different end of the spectrum of the increased prescribing. And I think that, you know, as well as the impact of the overall impact on the patients themselves, you know, looking at the, the prescribing element as well is really important. And, and I'm, I would hope that that would be part of the Scottish Government review. And I agree that we should run a, um, that in parallel with the PHE. OK. I mean, certainly, um, I mean, I hear what Brian says about anecdote, but I think there's a point when anecdote and testimony does become um, evidence where there's a pattern. And if there is a pattern, it may not be the causal link, but we have to look and see. I think there has to be an investigation. Another thing that strikes me very much from the evidence is the lack of trust and the degree of suspicion. So one of the questions we might want to ask the Scottish Government, if it were doing a review, how are they going to give people confidence that it's independent? Because that's kind of a recurring theme of, well, they would say that, so they've got a vested interest. Not that I'm accepting that view, but that is certainly something, the degree of lack of confidence and trust of people's experience is something that would have to be addressed in any, um, in any review. So are we agreeing that um, we, we return to the Scottish Government, specifically on the question of the helpline, reflecting the degree of interest in the petition itself and the way in which people have responded um, and asking for more detail and urging them that there should be a Scottish-focused review, but that this issue about the independence of that review would be important. Brian? Just, just as I, I, I thought, I mean, as I said, it's a much bigger issue, perhaps, than, than just what the petitioner is bringing. I wonder whether or not in terms of the increasing in uh, prescription of these drugs, are, are, would, would it be the intention for us to recommend we look at uh, the reasons behind that, uh, you know, pertaining to the potential other or lack mm -hmm. of other yeah. uh, treatments available? Um, well, this uh, committee knows, doesn't it, that yeah. the, an issue around um, prescription, where, and the, well, at least it's something we've explored with the Minister for Mental Health, or the previous Minister for Mental Health, potentially that... GPs are prescribing because they simply don't have the time to actually, you know, um, spend with somebody. And in fact, there is stuff in the evidence, isn't there, about the frustration around the 10-minute appointments. How can you possibly have a proper conversation with somebody mm. in your surgery when you've only got 10 minutes? And the fear would be that that very much longer-term piece of work around supporting somebody that becomes a jump to prescription. I don't think... I'm not saying that's what's happened, but I think mm. that would... We would hope that any review would look at that. Okay. Okay. So um, I think we are, we are agreeing again that we want to take this forward. We want to talk about the, the helpline with the Scottish Government. We want to press them on the issue of Scottish Focus Review, time scale, time scale, who would be involved, the issues that would be involved in that, and this issue around um, independence. I think we recognise that. Um, 
even just reflecting on the evidence we've been given, this is an issue for um, has generated a, a degree of interest, which the Scottish Government itself um, must be aware of. And we would also be alive to the issue, I think, that Jackie Bailey has raised, that this may be something we want to explore through debate um, in Parliament once we have a bit more um, to say on it. So if that's agreed, we would um, again want to thank petitioners for all the the information providers, including this infograph, which I think is very useful. Um, and can I thank Jackie Bailey for her attendance? Thank you. If we can now move back to the agenda, um, we want to deal go back to uh, the next continued petition for consideration, which is Petition 1533 on the abolition of non-residential social care charges for older and disabled people by Jeff Adamson on behalf of Scotland against the care tax. Members will recall at our last consideration of the petition, we agreed to write to the Scottish Government to seek an update on its assessment of Scotland against the care tax proposals on how to extend free personal care to people aged 65 and under. The Scottish Government submission explains that a finance subgroup has been set up to consider this in more detail, to consider in more detail the financial aspects of this policy and that the petitioner presented Scotland against the care tax proposals to the finance subgroup in July. The petitioner, however, indicates in his written submission received last month that despite delivering this presentation, he is, quote, none the wiser on how the Scottish Government stands on the implementation of the, pre of the free personal care policy. The petitioner also goes on to express serious concerns about how the extension of free personal care will be delivered, as outlined in our papers. I mean, and, and I should declare something of an interest. This is an area that I've explored um, around the potential for a, a private member's bill, which in itself is something of a challenge. We know there was also a demonstration on Tuesday where people came to the Parliament to raise their concerns about the current circumstance of people um, being supported in our communities. And I suppose the issue I'm very struck by is the importance of the support that people receive in order for them to have equal um, opportunity in terms of education and work. So it's not sort of an add-on. It actually, to me, it's like a human rights issue. It's about people's capacity to um, engage with society. Um, and I, I think, personally, I was a bit troubled that while the Finance Subcommittee um, did take a presentation, that the group who gave the presentation don't have any sense of what the implications are, what there has been a response to that. I also think that there is a question about the way in which this petition was taken alongside the Frank's Law petition. And I'm wondering whether there's maybe a sense of which, because the two were taken together, and happily some of that was resolved, that maybe this um, aspect, of which is much, it feels much more complex to me, has perhaps not been given the attention uh, um, it merits. But I'd be interested in the views of other committee members. Brian? I, 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 yeah. I, do, I do think there's, there is an issue around the clarification. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of with the petitioner on this one. I'm not quite sure uh, where, the, where the government sits with this. Um, I think it, it may be helpful uh, to get uh, uh, the cabinet secretary here. Perhaps she could, she could shed light on, on the, the direction of travel that the government are, are, are wanting to take. That might be helpful. That, that would be useful because we know that the previous cabinet secretary did make progress and we should acknowledge that around Frank's law, but this um, other very substantial issue would be useful to know what the thinking is. Angus? Yeah, I would agree. It would be helpful to get the cabinet secretary in to mm -hmm. uh, clarify a number, of, uh, a number of the issues. Okay. Rachel? I was just going to say that I wanted to make one point that I, I found um, some of the evidence that said that the local authorities had reduced the services to a critical need was um, uh, you know, quite disturbing. Mm -hmm. um, but I also wanted to ask convener whether um, what, what the um, when the Scottish government published their implementation advice um, shortly. I mean, will the will we bring in the um, cabinet secretary at following that, or when is that? advice likely to be um, Yeah, published. I think what would be, we want the Cabinet Secretary to come in at the point which is most productive. So if the, um, her office or she indicates that actually, you know, the, the merits of, of having her in front of the committee 
once that bit of work is done, well, that, that to me makes sense. I mean, we want it to be within a reasonable time scale, but we wouldn't want to, to have it in when she would say, well, it'll all be revealed in some report at a later stage. So I think we can negotiate that with her, um, with her department. Anyone else? No, in that case, can we agree that we're going to invite the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport to provide evidence to the committee on issues raised by the petitioner at a future meeting? And, of course, if the, the petitioner wants to provide a, a, a further submission ahead of that um, session, that would obviously be welcome. And, indeed, it's, there's nothing to stop others making such a submission as well. And I want to thank the petitioner again for um, keeping the committee informed on, on, on these issues. If we can now move to the next petition for consideration, which is petition 1545, on residential care provision for the severely learning disabled by Anne Maxwell on behalf of the Muir Maxwell Trust. At our last consideration of this petition in June, we noted the work that the Scottish Government had commissioned to address the data visibility of people with learning disabilities in Scotland, which includes projects by the Scottish Learning Disabilities Observatory. The petitioner, however, has raised concerns that this work does not explore the links between people with profound learning disabilities and epilepsy, despite 60% of people with profound learning disabilities having this condition. The petitioner also suggests that the financial consequences of inadequate care for the profoundly learning disabled should be a focus of the observatory's work. We therefore wrote to the observatory to ask whether any work was progressing in this area, in these areas. The response states that Scotland already has expertise on epilepsy at Edinburgh University and therefore has no plans to try to replicate this. The response also explains that his work was commissioned to undertake secondary analysis of Scotland's existing routinely collected health and administration data to inform policy and practice and that it was unaware of any existing data sets in Scotland that include a marker for profound learning disabilities. In her most recent written submission, the petitioner expresses disappointment that her petition has been under consideration by the committee for four years and that in that time, quote, nothing constructive and supportive has resulted. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. I must say I share the petitioner's frustration because we were, it was suggested that actually the observatory would be the response and the observatory clearly has come back and said no. So I think that there is a... You know, there's a frustration there that I think we would share around almost a... There's a conversation which is missing the point. You know, that the, the petitioner is arguing for one thing, the Scottish Government is responding with something that's not really relating to the questions that are being, are being raised. Brian? Um, yeah, I think that the, the, we're, we're, either, we're either going to... Right to the Scottish Government and, and uh, with with uh, with a more di more more direct uh, question, or or we're going to you know, ask the, the the Cabinet Secretary to come in and directly explain one of the two. I should probably note that uh, I coach somebody in this uh, in track and field and, and uh, with the, the, the with learning disabilities in this situation. So, Angus. Um. I think we've been going round the houses for four years on this one, um, and that's long enough. And I think another letter to the Scottish Government might just might just uh, prolong um, yeah. the the, yeah. the petitioner's anger and immense disappointment and uh, this committee's frustration. Um, so I think it's since we've agreed in the previous petition to uh, have the cabinet secretary in. Uh, to give evidence, I think we should uh, do the same for this petition. Is that agreed? That makes sense to me. I just I feel as if it's all, it's a dialogue which is, whether willfully or otherwise, is missing the point mm -hmm. and being able to direct um, the questions to the cabinet secretary, I think, would would clear that up and also affords the opportunity for the petitioner to be quite direct about the questions that she that they would want to see um, posed to the cabinet secretary. Is that agreed? Okay, so we, we're, we're recognising the frustration of the, the petitioner, um, but we don't. We do think there is an issue here that needs to be explored further, and so we will invite the cabinet secretary for health and sport to provide evidence to the committee on the issues raised by the petitioner at a future meeting. Okay, thank you very much for that. If we can now move to petition one six six seven by W Hunter Watson on the review of mental health and incapacity legislation. 
The petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to conduct a wide review of Scottish mental health and incapacity legislation, and when doing so, to take due account of recent developments in international human rights law. The Committee has previously considered written evidence from the Mental Welfare Commission for Scotland, the Scottish Human Rights Commission, and from the Minister for Mental Health. Following its most recent consideration at the meeting on 22nd March, the Committee has received an update from the Minister on various strands of work currently being undertaken and the timeframes and also a response from the petitioner to this, along with updated submissions from the petitioner supporting its call for action. Members will have noted that the petition recently met with the Minister for Mental Health to discuss the issues raised here. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? Um, yeah, I, 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 obviously this, this, is a, this is a big piece of work that's, been on the, that, that's consistently going through Parliament at the moment. Um, I think men, the mental health um, is, is a, a very strong topic, uh, uh, quite rightly so. Again, I, I, if I was going to take, take this forward, I would, I would actually suggest that we bring the Minister for, to, to take some moral evidence from the Minister, just to, to understand, again, where the Scottish Government are taking this. Um, it may be that the, the, the Minister, the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister um, for Mental Health, who is, of course, a new Minister, might want the opportunity mm. to be able to, rather than have it in correspondence, but to have an evidence session where they're able to outline more clearly what their position is. Um, it, it feels like we may have a session, we may have to put in an extra session as a committee, but specifically on that, you know, to try and coordinate the Cabinet Secretary and Mental, Minister for Mental Health just coming and doing a session on the relevant petitions, that might be um, worthwhile. I, I, do, I do feel that, uh, you know, by, by taking evidence from the Minister, it would afford us the, you know, the, the, the potential to really jump forward uh, quite significantly with this, with this petition, rather than written correspondence. Okay. Are we ag agreeing that then, that uh, we do think this would be a very useful um, opportunity to get evidence from the Minister for Mental Health um, and we can obviously negotiate with the, the, the departments about how best that can be done and how best we can have maximum effect for the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister for Mental Health being here and pursuing these issues and petition with them. Is that agreed? Okay. In that case, thank you very um, much for that. If we can now move to petition 1673 um, by James Mackey on the operation and running of child protection services in Scotland. Members will recall that this petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to create an independent QC-led inquiry into the operation and running of child protection services in Scotland. The papers note that we last considered this petition on 10th May. The committee had agreed that there may be some issues around early intervention that may be worth exploring, and also whether we're inappropriately bringing children into care because there is not enough support or because there's a mindset that says that that is the solution. We have submissions from the Scottish Children Reporter Administration and Social Work Scotland and a response to these from the petitioner. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Uh, Rachel? The, the report um, of the Child Protection Improvement Programme um, stated that the, there was a commitment to reconvene the Child Protection System Review Group in April 2018. Um, I think it would be useful to ask um, the Minister for Child Care in early years whether um, what, what had come out of that um, group, if indeed it has been um, reconvened. Can do that. Anything else? We passed, ask maybe um, the, the, the the care review consideration of the care review. Uh, might be might be somewhere we could maybe shed a little bit more light on it. Well, we certainly could you know, be thinking about um, identifying areas of consideration to the care review. I mean, the education committee took evidence from um, Fiona Duncan, who's heading up the care review, and it was impressive not just because of her presentation, but the. Um, the evidence given by care experienced young people um, with her, and you're know, very aware that that 
um, review is a very thoughtful and substantial piece of work, which is very much dealing with young people who are in the system. The petition, of course, deals with whether people are coming in appropriately into the system, and I'm not sure if the key review is asking that question, but we can maybe um, ask that um, of them. I was also very struck by the substantial evidence given by the Scottish Children's Reporters and Admin and Social Work Scotland. I thought there was a lot of food for thought in, the, in those, and well, it would be for the petitioner themselves to decide, but I mean, a reassurance, I felt that there wasn't some kind of... That, you know, when a young person, person is coming into the hearing system and into the care system, it's done with a great deal of, of thought. But I wonder whether, you know, there are suggestions about how we might take this forward. We can ask, certainly ask questions of um, the Scottish Government in this. We can maybe uh, flag up to the care review that this is an issue that's been ex the petitioner has highlighted and maybe get some sense from them whether that's something that they're looking at. I suspect the remit doesn't deal with that, but it would be something we could maybe check. Anything else? Angus? Uh, nothing to add, can we now? No. So we, we would be looking for an update from the Minister for Child Care in early years um, on child protection issues, I think, um, and looking at the, the Child Protection Improvement Programme report. Is that agreed? OK, in that case, can we again um, thank the petitioner for their engagement with the committee and um, the, the responses we've received from all those that we highlighted. Um, we, we raised this petition with. If we can now move on to petition 1687, the regulation of firework displays in Scotland. The last petition for consideration in public today is petition 1687 on regulation of fireworks displays in Scotland by Jane Erskine. The clerk's note summarises the submissions from the Scottish and UK Government, along with the petitioner's response to those submissions. The UK Government Minister's submission addresses the issues of the need for appropriate guidance, education and public awareness raising to promote responsible use of fireworks. Um, he considers it is a matter for the Scottish Government to work with local agencies to identify what measures are best to apply in the context of this petition. The Scottish Government acknowledges the issues raised in the petition in the context of animals and livestock in rural areas. It notes the petitioner's concern that as an animal owner in a rural area, she is liable under the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006 for any harm to the animals in her care and considers that this may be an unintended consequence of the Act. The Scottish Government submission outlines activity that it and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and Police Scotland have been taking forward since last year principally in the context of incidents where the Fire and Rescue Service have been subject to attack, but also highlighting how this might impact on the provision of emergency support. In recent correspondence with the clerks, the Scottish Government has also stated that the Minister for Community Safety has written to all community safety partnerships across Scotland and also to the UK Minister for Small Business, Consumers and Corporate Responsibility to request an update on any actions following the Westminster Hall debate in January this year. The petitioner acknowledges the Scottish Government's submission and considers that this serves to highlight the impact that this has on animals and animal owners in rural areas. She indicates that she would like to see the UK and Scottish Government adopt a preventative and a proactive approach to the restriction of fireworks displays in rural areas. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Rachel? I'm missing something here in this petition, but um, it, it is up to the local authorities to um, enforce the licensing. And I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to uh, know if the local authorities had been um, engaged in this whole process. Because it, 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 at the end of the day, the Scottish Government did say that it, it is up to the up to the local authorities. So um, I just wanted to know where we were with regards to the Scottish Government's responsibility over this, if it lies with local authorities, ultimately. OK, I think we can, we can um, contact COSLA, perhaps, in the first instance. And I guess that the petition is really talking about the legislative context in which everybody is operating. If you accept it, you can have fireworks displays it's saying about managing them and managing it safely. I actually think it's quite an interesting argument which says if her animals are in fear and alarm, to what extent is she responsible for that? As someone under the act who's responsible for the care of the animals, you wonder whether 
I wouldn't have thought it'd be a court in the land would um, blame her if her animals are distressed as a consequence of firework displays that the law allows. But I mean, that's an interesting insight into it, which I hadn't really thought about before. The rurality of the um, displays, because obviously there's going to be more animals um, in, in the in rural areas and the countryside. So whether the local authorities take into account that when they, um, you know, give a public licence to a firework display, I'm actually not entirely sure. Mm -hmm. It is an issue that's been raised with me by uh, people who have pets that during the period that kind of quite intense period round. Um, November the 5th, the animals are in fear and alarm in urban areas as well, so it's, but that's not really the focus of the petition here. So I think we can certainly write to COSL, I think we should write to Scottish Government for an update um, on its recent action. It might be worth writing to Police Scotland and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, because they must have a view on whether it's creating extra work for them. I know, uh, certainly in my own area, Historically, there was problems about the fire service being attacked when they came in to deal with um, unlicensed fireworks displays, which is maybe a different thing altogether. So they, they, they may have a view on how the, this is all managed um, safely and for their views on specific action called for in the petition and in particular comments in the petition's most recent submission. It might be worthwhile contacting them. Is that agreed? agreed. Anything else? No? Well, we should, I suppose we're coming up to that period now, so it will be interesting <coughs> to see um, whether those concerns about the whole implications of celebration with fireworks um, continues to have the impact that's been flagged up by um, the petitioner. But we can again, thank the petitioner for um, providing us with an update on, on their views. If we can now close the public um, session of the meeting, and we're moving into private, and we'll um, have a quick break before we deal with the last item of the agenda. <laughs>